claims to be the inspired word of God, the New Testament. And I just want to show that to you. Take a look at your outline in John 16. The Bible says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. And so the Holy Spirit guided these writers and he inspired them to create these New Testament books. Now, notice what it says in 2 Timothy. And I want us to read it out loud together, okay? With some great enthusiasm. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. Uh, How many are ready for the Charger game? Uh, I thought you'd be a little bit more excited than that. How many are ready for the Viking game? Woo! Okay. How many are ready to read out loud? That's good. That's really good. Let's start it. Let's read it. All scripture is given by inspiration from God. So what does that mean? It means that God supernaturally worked through these writers' life, inspiring them through the Holy Spirit to give them exactly what to say. It comes from God. In 2 Peter 1, Peter says this, You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origins in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. A lot of people say, you know, there's probably a bunch of drunk guys in the back room writing this stuff down, right? It doesn't make any sense. But the reality is, it makes perfect sense, and it follows Jesus' life. And we're going to see how... This message of of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ is formulated throughout the whole Old Testament. I want you to notice this warning in Revelation that the Apostle John writes in Revelation. He says this. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecies of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes... uh, words away from the book of this prophecy. Notice what it says. God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. You know, it was so serious, the writings of the book of Revelation and all the Old Testament and New Testament, that, that we are exhorted not to try and take things away from it. You know, a lot of people like to live and they say, well, I believe this about the Bible, but I don't believe that. Or, or I think it means this, and it's totally contradictory to what the rest of the scripture says. You can't add from it. You can't take anything away from it. It is God's word to us. Now, it's interesting that some other people, this is kind of funny. I'm just going to show you my Bible. You guys notice how some of the words are in red, right? They're supposed to be like quoting Jesus, Right? Those are the words of Jesus. And some people will take their Bible and say, you know what? I only believe the words that are in red. You probably hadn't heard that before. I know I have. I only believe the words are in red. But the reality is all scripture is God breathed. It is all from God. And, and the red words, uh, there were no red words in the first uh, writing that came along much later. Uh, much later, but it's all God's word. Now, I just want to, to, to think about this. There are three criteria, criteria that were used to figure out which is God's word. You know, they had all these writings at the time, but what was actually God's word? How did they formulate that? Well, I want you to notice this. I gave you three things on your outline. Number, <clears throat> number one is this. Uh, a New Testament book was considered God's word because it was written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. Now, how does that work? Well, Matthew and John, those are the ones who wrote out of the Gospels we're going to look at today. They wrote Matthew and they wrote the book of John. But Mark was a close associate of Peter and Luke was a close associate of Paul. Okay, And so that's how they were recognized. They were very close to these people. Number two, they were recognized and accepted by the early church as authoritative truth from God. The church said that is God's word. Not only did it come from these writers who knew Jesus personally or those people who knew of Jesus and knew those personal close friends of Jesus, but the church had to say that is the authoritative word of God. Now, number three is this. Is it doctrinally consistent when talking about God and Jesus? 
Is it doctrinally consistent or does it stray off? Is it all over the place? Uh, it's important to, to, note, to note this. I, I wrote it down. I just want to read it to you. The New Testament book's authority is established by God. I want you to get that. The New Testament is established by God as authoritative. Now, listen to this. And it's merely discovered by God's people. Now, there's a difference there. It wasn't a group of guys at some council in Nicaea 400 years after the fact getting together in a room and saying, we like this, we like this, we like this. That's not the way it happened. God had these people write their words. It was recognized as it came from God. And the people were discovering that. Now, I just want to give you another side note. Uh, these are the same three criteria used to recognize that there were some books that were not, uh, not from the Word of God, not God's Holy Scripture. A couple examples. The Apocrypha. Some books have the Apocrypha. You guys are familiar with this, some of you. Some Bibles have this, these other added books to their Bible. But the reality is that these books were not recognized by the Jewish people as the authoritative Word of God. That's why we don't have them in our Bibles today. Some people do. Uh, I believe the Catholic Church adds those in the Catholic Bible. There were other so-called Gospels, and I just want to point out a few, because uh, a few years ago with this whole Da Vinci Code thing, this whole idea of these other Gospels that the Church have been purposely hiding from you, just so you wouldn't know the truth about God. Well, they found the Gospel according to Thomas, that's probably the one I'm most familiar with, the Gospel according to Philip, the Gospel according to Mary Magdalene, and the Gospel according to Judas. Right? Now, let me just say a couple things about that. Those books were written a few hundred years, 200 to 300 years after the death of Christ. They were written by people who did not know Christ. They were written by people who contradicted what the first apostles wrote. And, and mainly, the reality behind these books, uh, they're called Gnostic Gospels for a reason. Um, the reason is this, this idea of Gnosticism, it means of having some, some sort of superior knowledge than everybody else. And so these writers that are 300 years after the New Testament come along and say, look, this is God's word. We have a special revelation from God. And yet it contradicted everything that the, the followers of Christ had been studying for 300 years. And so they were not recognized as authoritative word of God. Now, I just want to give you a couple of other facts. The Bible remains uh, the strongest bibliographic uh, uh, classical literature uh, of all time. Um, I wrote it on your outline. The Bible has the stronger uh, bibliographic support than any other classical piece of history. I gave you one example. I said this um, from Plato's life. The writings of Plato date back to 400 B.C. And the earliest copies we possess to date are 900 A.D. Okay, so 300 B.C., 900 A.D. The time gap between the original and the, what we have in our possession today is uh, 1,300 years. You want to know how many copies we have? Seven of those copies. You know, we, we look at Plato's writings and we think, man, that was great. He was this philosopher. He was this wise guy. But, but the reality is we have this huge gap between the original writings and, and what we have in existence today. On the, on the other hand, the New Testament, take a look at this. I'm just going to read the second part. There are nearly 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in libraries and universities around the world. The time gap between the original composition and our earliest copies is an unbelievably short 50 years or so. It's a fragment from John's Gospel. It's currently located in John Ryland's library in Manchester, England. Why did I tell you that? Because I'm the kind of guy who says, oh yeah? Where is it? Right? Prove it. Well, it's there. Go look it up. You can find it there. Uh, notice what I said under outline. Today we're going to look at the first four Gospels. The uh, Gospel means what? You guys know? Good news. You might want to write that down. We're going to look at these four letters from these four different people today that means good news. I wrote on your uh, outline this idea of synoptic Gospels. Uh, what is that? Uh, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And basically, these three guys are looking at the life of Jesus from three different viewpoints. Synoptic. What does that mean? 